From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're Inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS exchanges and clearinghouses around the world. And now, welcome inside the Ice House. Here's your host, Josh King of Intercontinental Exchange. I'm fond of taking what's known as busman's holidays. And perhaps you've heard of the term. I don't know when I first heard it, but its origins date back to 1893 in the United Kingdom, referring to when a busman or a bus driver or something like that would go off on a vacation in, wait for it, a bus, thereby engaging in a similar recreational activity to his or her actual day job. And that's what's brought me to Vail, Colorado, with a small briefcase containing all I need to record an Inside the Ice House episode, usually an activity I undertake weekly from the library of the New York Stock Exchange. I've done it a couple times before across our now 400 plus episodes in Boca Raton, Florida, in London, in Salt Lake City, at the U.S. Open in Flushing Meadow, and now in the global epicenter of skiing here in Vail, the flagship of Vail Resorts NYSE ticker symbol MTN, or Mountain. And yes, I've taken a few turns as well when I'm out here for a few days of vacation, staying at the home of my friends Douglas and Liz Smith, folks I knew back in the time working in government in Washington, making the plan to come out here. I mentioned to Doug that, well, if time permitted, I'd like to record a couple episodes relevant to what we do here at the New York Stock Exchange. Well, Doug got right to work, even while he's serving as my guide through Vale's legendary back bowls and an equally treacherous tour through Vale's vaunted opera ski scene, ending the evening at Scott Redner's famous shakedown bar on Bridge Street in the heart of Vale Village. So we begin our busman's holiday, thanks to Doug's vast relationships in town, adjacent to the operating theater of the Stedman Clinic, founded by the eminent orthopedic surgeon Dr. J. Richard Stedman, who passed away about a year ago in 2023. A renowned innovator in the field of orthopedic sports medicine, Dr. Stedman was internationally known for developing advanced surgical procedures for the favorite of all joints, the knee, including what was known as the healing response and the package, a technique which can restore normal movement to painfully arthritic knees. Dr. Stedman became the go-to surgeon for the world's best-known athletes, returning many elite players in the NBA, NFL, NBA, Major League Baseball, pro soccer, and, of course, skiing. Now, beyond Vail itself being a New York Stock Exchange-listed company, you might wonder how modern-day orthopedic surgeons interact with businesses listed on the big board. Well, you'd look no further than Johnson & Johnson, NYSE ticker symbol JNJ, the storied pharmaceutical and medical technologies giant that started in 1873 after Robert Wood Johnson began his professional training at age 16 as a pharmacist's apprentice at an apothecary run by his mother's cousin, a Mr. James G. Wood of Poughkeepsie, New York, paving the way then for a novel procedure at the time, something called antiseptic surgery. Fast forward 139 years to 2012. That's when J&J completed the $19.7 billion acquisition of Synthes Inc. to create the world's leading orthopedics business, now known as Dupuis Synthes. Now, you take a look at J&J's Dupuis Synthes website, today. And you see medical miracles like the Attune knee system, which replaces the deteriorating joint, the Titan anchor, the next generation of tendon fixation, and the enhanced shoulder system, Johnson & Johnson's latest innovation in shoulder replacement technology. All of these systems and those like them from other manufacturers, whether used on sports stars, wounded warriors, or just aging skiers like me, are being put to the test here at the Stedman Clinic in Vail. Well, Dr. Richard Stedman's scalpel, embedding those products into the knees and shoulders of the clinic's patients, is now in the steady hands of Dr. Matt Preventure, 
along with other surgeons at Stedman, Matt carries on Dr. Stedman's legacy as one of the nation's leading orthopedists, specializing in the treatment and rehabilitation of injuries to the knee and shoulder. And luckily, on this trip, I was not in need of Matt's expert services. Instead, we talked about Matt's career, which began on the playing fields of Oyster River High School in Durham, New Hampshire, and led to the United States Naval Academy, where he rose to deputy brigade commander among his fellow midshipmen and earned the recognition as first team All-American as an oarsman for the Navy crew. But alas, like so many aspiring Maverick Mitchells, Matt couldn't fly jets like his brother because of corrected vision, so instead he took his electrical engineering talents to medical school at Dartmouth and then began his residency at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego. As part of his broad practice, Matt designed studies to help our military members return to duty in a safer and more predictable manner through development of EMPOWER, which stands for Mobile Platform for Optimizing Warfare Rehabilitation a program used to test the military warfighter prior to return to battle. From 2007 to 2013, Matt was appointed Director of Sports Medicine and Surgery and then Head Orthopedic Teams Physician for Navy SEAL Teams 1, 3, 5, and 7, where he was instrumental in setting up the Special Forces Tactical Athlete Program, a comprehensive wellness, injury prevention, and rehabilitation program for Naval Special Forces. Now... A lot of a naval officer's career isn't focused solely on battle. Matt's also led extensive humanitarian and disaster relief work, serving as director for surgical services for five years aboard the USNS ship Mercy, leading the surgical team during Pacific Partnership 2012, the largest humanitarian and civic action in the Asia-Pacific region, focused on building stronger relationships and improving disaster response capabilities with partner nations. And then, moving from battlefield to ball field, Matt became medical director and head physician for the New England Patriots during the 2014 Super Bowl championship season, pioneering a wellness and injury prevention program for Coach Bill Belichick's team, along the way adding service as assistant team physician for my Boston Red Sox and Boston Bruins. If you take a walk through the hallways of the Stedman Clinic to Matt's office, you stare, dumbfounded, at what is a vast Hall of Fame gallery of jerseys and uniforms of sports legends that Matt and his colleagues have fixed up and got back into action, just as he continues to do so as a Navy reservist, most recently assigned to Navy SEAL Team 17 in Coronado, California. Our conversation with Matt Preventure on service, surgery, and sports, and how they're all interwoven in the application of medical miracles at Vail's renowned Stedman Clinic, it's coming up. Right after this. When you think of investment risk, do you consider climate risk? Changing weather patterns are impacting the way we live and the value of businesses, large and small. This can mean disruption to supply chains, changing demand for products, and shifting regulation. What does this mean for your business, your clients, and your investments? ICE offers data and markets that can provide critical insight. Manage your climate risk with ICE. Welcome back inside the ICE house. Remember to subscribe wherever you listen and rate and review us on Apple Podcasts so others know where to find us. Our guest today is Dr. Matt Preventure. Dr. Preventure is a sports medicine specialist and orthopedic knee and shoulder surgeon here at the Stedman Clinic in Vail, Colorado, where I sit and look out of Dr. Preventure's office at this amazing view where I have just completed 32,000 vertical feet over the last six or seven hours. He was previously the chief of sports medicine at the Mass General Hospital in my hometown of Boston, as well as medical director and team physician for the NFL's six-time Super Bowl champion, New England Patriots. Dr. Preventure graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1993, where he's a four-year varsity oarsman and two-time first-team All-American for the rowing squad. He served as an orthopedic staff surgeon at the Naval Medical Center San Diego from 2004 to 13, and was appointed the director of sports medicine and surgery in 2007. In 2021, Dr. Preventure was named one of the top 28 shoulder surgeons and one of the top 28 knee surgeons in the United States by Orthopedics Today. I am glad that I'm not using his services today. Matt, thanks so much for joining us inside the Ice House. It's great to talk to you here in Colorado. 
Josh, thank you very much. It's a very kind introduction. And I, I dude, I'm impressed. 32K today. It's a legendary day, my friend. That's nice. good. You know, where I usually ski upstate New York, I'll start at maybe 8.15, 8.30. I'll ski hard until 11.30, and then Pinot Noir takes over, and I'll be lucky if I've got 12,000 in. So this was a great day. But, you, I mean, obviously you must have had some ski time back in New Hampshire working for Simon, right? I mean, you had, I mean... Waterville Valley, yeah. Loon, Sunapee, Sunday River in Maine, Sugarbush, Killington, Mount Snow in Vermont. But now I pretty much stick to New York. I don't get to... That's our, where I cut my teeth as well. Yeah, it yes. was super cool spots back there. But it gives you an appreciation for coming out to a place like How many Dale. days do you usually get? What's, what's your regimen? I mean, I came in, you, were, you had a case that you were attending to, and you're, you know, you, you've got people from... Judging from the uniforms on your walls, you must be backed up. But how, how often do you get up there? Uh, it's, it's pretty good, Josh. You know, it's it's nice being here. There's times when I'm staring at the mountain out my window that I want to be out there taking turns and get some fresh powder. But we, we get out there and get after it pretty well. It's a, it's a really nice, uh, you know, work and play environment here in Vail. I imagine. And I imagine that when the football season ends as it has now, except for one last game, some of the people will come in here to attend to some of their problems during the season get ready for camp coming up but we're recording this episode a couple days before Super Bowl 58 at Allegiant Stadium in Las Vegas so I'm not going to ask you to prognosticate on what the final score will be in that game but one of the chief superstars Isaiah Pacheco had clean up shoulder surgery in December and has still been dominant during the playoffs how much has medicine advanced on that particular joint over the past five years that a guy can have intrusion into his shoulder in December and still be dominant through this tournament. Yeah, you know, it's amazing. And, and you know, hats off to Pacheco, the medical staff, and everyone else for, you know, doing such a great job with him. And, I mean, look at the playoff performance. I mean, he is a huge reason why they're in the playoffs and in the Super Bowl and in the show. And it's really amazing. And, you know, over my 25-plus years of being involved with this and doing this and, you know, having a great honor to take care of so many of these super high-talented individuals – has been humbling, but what we're learning is how to make things stronger, more efficient, how to get you back efficiently and at your best without the risk or minimizing the risk of re-injury. And there's always that tricky balance. And we're, we've got biologics, we've got better anchors, we've got better strong tape sutures, we've got the Rogers internal brace, we've got all these innovations that have come in sports medicine to help let's face it, not just the pros, but you know, people like you and I to get back to our, to our activities and at a very high level. Pacheco is a young and resilient 24-year-old out of Rutgers. Aaron Rodgers, he has 16 years on Isaiah. The future Hall of Famer ruptured his Achilles four snaps into his tenure with the New York Jets and had surgery on September 13th. So Matt, if number 12 walks into the Stedman Clinic, sits on your examination table, tomorrow. What are you looking for in terms of his fitness to play and how would you advise him about preparing for the 24-25 season if he should be preparing at all? Yeah, so, you know, Aaron, there was all talk about him getting back because of how well he was doing, how his, his ankle felt. I mean, he was taking some you know, slow snaps on the field at, uh, in the Meadowlands and, and doing some practice work and everyone was excited and Jets Nation certainly was hoping. But, you know, the, the, the Jets had a reasonable season, not, not terrible, but I, the problem is even if that thing heals well and even if it does well, guess what takes time? And I don't care if it's Rogers or 24-year-old or you and I, we got to get our muscles strong. And I guarantee you, I haven't felt his calf, but if you feel it, you're going to have some muscle atrophy. It just yeah. takes time to build that up. And so there's risk of re-injury if you aren't optimized and it's the entire kinetic chain it's the muscles it's working with our physical therapists our strength conditioning all the people that help put us back together and on the field or back to whatever craft we want to do before we talk more about your life that you've built here in the rocky mountains and this clinic i want to go back to sea level and start with your time at the naval academy specifically your involvement with rowing it's a requirement that all midshipmen participate in some form of athletics as they prepare morally, mentally, and physically for a career in the fleet. And like you, my son rose for Navy. He's a plebe with the men's lights. And like you, he's a walk-on, wrestling daily with like trying to get his personal best on the erg, even with all the other commitments on the yard. What inspired you to pursue rowing during your time at the academy? Well, Josh, first of all, I am 
psyched your son's doing this. This is amazing. It was it was probably one of the best things I did in college. And, you know, the Naval Academy has so many great things about it, like you said, morally, mentally, physically. But it's the ultimate leadership laboratory on, a laboratory on top of it. And we're able to learn how to lead, how what not to do, what how to motivate people, how to, you know, be a really good person, your situational awareness, everything else. I got to tell you, the time at the boathouse, though, was fantastic. And the ability to have an incredible group of brothers that you row with. Uh, I was a lightweight myself. I was, I was close, light, and heavyweight. My brother also rode. He was a heavyweight, much better genetics than myself, and 6'4", and a heavyweight guy, and he rode four years. But we both really didn't row. We had, we had a little taste of it in New Hampshire at a, at a program for a couple weeks in, in Durham, New Hampshire. But that was about it. We just kind of walked on. We're just like... They grabbed us and said, hey, come try out for the team. And that's what Toby's experience was in Plebe Summer, too. And he looked at a couple other sports and just ended up with it. And, like, it hasn't been an easy year so far. Do you get a point in your Plebe year when you said, I'm coming from New Hampshire. This is overwhelming to me. I don't have all this time to put all that time in that boathouse. No question. I mean, there was a lot. I, I have to tell you, we, uh, I was very fortunate that our high school, I went, I went to a high school, public high school in Durham, New Hampshire, and I, we didn't know it at the time, but prepared me and I know many others of my classmates from high school unbelievably well to go on to the next level. And so, I, you know, Naval Academy was never easy, but at least from the academic side, I was able to hold my own. And, you know, I was like, wow, I this little kid from New Hampshire here, you know, I was worried about all these other things going on. You know, the academics, you had to work hard. And I was an electrical engineer, of course. Of course, I picked a pretty hard major. I don't know. It's just kind of my, my poison along the way. But I, I like the, sol- the problem solving. I like the engineering. I, I like that aspect of it. And it taught me so much. But having the boathouse, having a sport, having a group of just really incredible people that you're around all the time. And I know your son, Toby, is uh, encourage him to continue that because it's an incredible four years to complement everything you're learning at the academy. This area is not known as much for Navy as it is for Army. The 10th Mountain Division was formed in 1941 in Camp Hale, about 30 miles south between Leadville and Red Cliff. And it was then Pete Seibert, New Englander, also who served in the 10th, came back from the war and opened this resort with the support from Jack Tweedy. Did that heritage of Pete and this sort of New England tint and military experience give you comfort when you arrived in this place? Yeah, there's no question. There, there's a great New England transplant. There's, you know, I went to Dartmouth for med school, New Hampshire kid. There's a lot of people from that area here, uh, and it, it certainly gave a lot of comfort. But there's so much more to it than that. You know, the, the 10th Mountain and all the training and what went into it and World War II and them all heading off to Europe. It's, it's really an incredible story. And the, the ski museum here and the... Checked it out earlier today. Does, yeah, it does an amazing job at, at, I think, telling that story, which, you know, many of us don't know. But from my military background plus New Hampshire background, v- Vail was a natural. I mean, I love Boston. Don't get me wrong, but th- this is a great place. Given the deep military roots in your family, including your grandfather's service in the Army and National Guard, your father's Naval Academy background, and, and your brother's similar path, was a military career always predetermined for you? How did it all work out for you? You know, that Josh, there was, you know, we're always, you know, and if you're out there listed about your kids and going to college, this or that, you're like, oh, you would probably had the path and parents are saying, go to Navy, go to this. Well, I, I did apply to the service academies, but I had applied a bunch of other places. I, the service academy was kind of an afterthought for me at the end of the day. And I was like, well, you know, I'm looking at some other places. I'm checking out Brown and Dartmouth and University of New Hampshire and uh, places in you know, upstate New York where you, you were from. And I, I just, at the end of the day, the Naval Academy kind of landed in my lap and my dad had gone there. But it was never pushed on me, which I think was really important. And a really important lesson just now as a parent now that I have an older son who's not at the Naval Academy, he's at UVA and really thriving there and enjoying the, the system there. But you have to, you know, always, always support your kids, open their eyes a little bit, but support your kids. I think that's exactly what my parents did. So they did it perfectly. And I think my, my brother followed in footsteps because the same way. Your career path, medicine, you know, not necessarily preordained when you think about surface warfare officers, special warfare submarines, aviation. What led you down the medical path? Yeah, Josh, this is a super interesting story. So I, you know, Top Gun's coming out when we're heading to college. Tom Cruise, it's cool. I mean, that was also part of it. Let's be honest, to go there. And I wanted to fly. I wanted to fly jets. Problem is my eyes went to like 2050 vision, 2055, 2060. And I was like, and we couldn't have surgery. We couldn't have LASIK, couldn't have PRK. And so we had to 
could, I wasn't qualified. You had to pick something else. I was not qualified to be a SEAL, which was also on my list. It was not qualified to do a uh, Navy diver, SEAL, special warfare, or fly. I could be a backseat pilot, but I wanted to be a front seat pilot. <laughs> That's who I am. It's my DNA. My brother got the much better genetics, perfect vision, much better genetics. He was the F-18 pilot. So I kind of live vicariously through him and many of my other friends. But medicine sort of landed in my lap. No one in my family was a medicine. I'm like the family doctor. I take care of all the ailments and not even orthopedic. Um, and that's always, it's a, it's a blessing to, to do what I do now. And, and I'm very honored and humbled, but you look along the way and there's so many mentors that I think all of us that are listening have to be thankful for and mentors that I certainly have to be thankful for. And it's maybe a 10 or 20 second conversation that probably shifted my life to go into medicine. And it's amazing. My, I called my dad and I was devastated. I got my physical for my eyes. They were bad. It can't be a pilot. I was devastated. What do you do? He's like, go see Dean John Kelly. He's the dean. He was my chemistry professor. He's the dean. Now just go talk to him. And I went into his office, classic. He was old dean of students and <clears throat> dust off my dad's record from the 60s there. He's like, I tried to get your dad to go to medicine. Would you ever consider medicine? And it was literally a, a two-minute conversation. And he kind of set me on the path. So you go from Annapolis to Dartmouth, as you said, for medical school. You've got four years of incredible discipline scheduling, and you end up on the kind of Ivy League campus that you might have looked at as an undergraduate, saying that you looked at Brown as well. What was the sort of cultural sort of shock for you to go from the yard up to New Hampshire? Back? And Josh, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it with your son and all the stuff, you know, incredible stuff you've done, which I'm super impressed with, by the way. But you talk about the discipline of time of life of what you had at the Naval Academy and it's sort of just, we all went through it and everyone, everyone had it. And in fact, I had a pretty significant leadership position there. I was the second in command, the deputy brigade commander. So when I picked medicine, you know, the commandant of midshipmen, the superintendent, you know, it was always mingling with all the time because we had all these dignitaries and having dinner with Margaret Thatcher and all these dignitaries, all, they were always coming to the Naval Academy and hanging out. We were always the, the brigade commander. I was a deputy brigade commander myself and a few others would always have to go to these events. It was always crushing my studies. <laughs> so yeah. Always on a Tuesday night, a Thursday night right. or whatever. And you're like, oh, rowing practice, everything else going on. But it was amazing when you look back, but the superintendent of the commandant, like, really, you're going medicine? You're going the other way? That's, you're not a, you're not a line officer. You need to be, you need to go to a submarine. You're an electrical engineer. You need to go be on a ship. You need to go lead. You need to go command. And I got that, but it really, I, I had a great, another mentor and a guy who was General Terry Murray. And he was the Deputy Commandant was a football player at the Naval Academy. He said, listen, you're doing a great job here. We need great leaders in medicine. We need great leaders to take care of me, my knee, my shoulder. And so that's why I continued on the path. But to summarize, when I got to Dartmouth, it was it was awesome. I loved it. I was like, this is, a, this is sort of a college experience, uh, you know, in medical school. And, uh, you know, there were just a, a million less rules. You know, if I didn't want to go to class, I didn't really have to. I did because it was how I learned, but uh, having a little bit less structure for me after four years in Naval Academy was, was really good. And I also, I, I loved it there. Dartmouth was fantastic. I'd go do it again. I'd have to ask because it's so current and you have such a unique perspective of having four years at a service academy and then back to Dartmouth for med school. You know, we're watching what's happening on Ivy League and college campuses around the country today. Ken Griffin has suspended his uh, he's given $500 million to Harvard already, but he's halted donations because he sort of dismisses what's happening on these campuses as a bunch of whiny snowflakes. You saw what kind of student and patriot the service academy turns out, and yet you also are an alma mater of the Ivy League. So what's your take? Yeah, you know, it's it's really interesting to watch, watch it unfold because I, I, I think... I, the the Naval Academy, the military's cross section of America. You know, we dealt with very similar issues and problems and situations. And we have all walks of life: men, women, different cultures, uh, different skin colors. And you know, we we I got interviewed all the time about you know our treatment of women at the Naval Academy, our treatment of different races, our treatment of African Americans, our treatment of Jews. The Naval Academy, whatever it was, whatever group it was. And I said, listen, we got our wake up call a long time ago. We were we're the we're the military and we treat everyone with fairness, transparency, uh, with the utmost of integrity and the utmost of respect. And so that's the environment I grew up in. That's the environment my parents raised me in. And if, if I see less of that, it, it, it doesn't sit well with me because that's what I've been raised to do. 
and be about, and it's how we take care of our patients. Everyone, you know, you might have a little bit busier schedule. You might be a super busy pro player or an admiral in the Navy or the chief of naval operations. Yeah, I got to respect your schedule a little bit, but you're getting the same treatment as anyone else out there. And for me, growing up in New Hampshire, that's that's how we did it. We never had that. Uh, for me, there really wasn't that caste difference or uh, difference of people. Everyone you had to treat with respect. And if you didn't, my mom would kill me. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, that's a good mom about. and a good dad, Matt. I mean, up in Hanover, you found your calling in, in orthopedics and brought that calling to your orthopedic residency at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego in 2004. And it was there until 2013 that you gave medical care for Navy SEAL teams one, three, five, and seven. As the head of orthopedic team physician for these SEALs, what strategies and processes did you implement to make sure that they imp- they performed at peak levels? Yeah, Josh, this this was another great journey that, uh, you know, being a rower, you, your son's going to go through this, you went through this during your sports days as well, is how do you take care of our most important commodity, which is the human body, the trained human soldier, the warrior, the Navy SEAL, the female Marine, you, you name it, that's our most important commodity. And taking care of your body, taking care of yourself, you got to do that first before everything else. And so we learned to, we weren't doing a great job at it. And so we learned we had to get better. And with that, we had to, guess what? In the military, you got to use data. You have to use information. You have to use analytics because you have to show what this means, what the return on investment is going to be, what we save the government, and how we do a better job with our people and having them ready for the government's needs, the president's wishes. That's what we had to do. And when we were able to do that and sit down, we literally sat down at a bar in Coronado and sketched out on a napkin of what this human performance program would look like, at least for Navy Special Warfare. But now it's, you know, I'm very proud that, it, that many other smart what people beyond have on it. Uh, it was, it was literally a bunch of columns and, and circles of like, this is, <laughs> this is what we've got. This is, we're, we need better, we need better resilience training. We need better mental capacity and mental health and mental wellness training. We need psychology. We need, uh, strength conditioning we need performance analysis. We need to assess your hips and shoulders and knees, your musculoskeletal condition. We need to see how your back's doing. We don't want you to get injured before deployment. We don't want you to get injured during deployment, devastating to a unit, devastating to the morale devastating to the function is you get injured while you're trying to go out and do your job. It's just like a pro football player, same in the military and anyone in the military. It could be a sub sub driver, it could be a female Marine, it could be a Navy SEAL. So that's what we wanted to do was add the, I wanted to know more about you and your body and your performance and you knew yourself. And that's the culture we really tried to show big government, big joint special operations command, big Marine, big Navy, to be able to bring these programs to enhance and protect our most important commodity, which is the human. Sometimes the doc is not always around when the SEAL team is deployed. There's medics who have training, but we lost two Navy SEALs, Christopher Chambers and Nathan Ingram in the Arabian Sea off Somalia a couple weeks ago. Their situation seemed perilous, but how are SEALs trained now to protect themselves on dire missions and when injured, administer emergency medical aid. Yeah, you know, I you know, I'm definitely not a SEAL, so I don't want to speak to training, haven't gone through it or anything, but you know, having taken care of the folks, what I, what I can speak to is how we optimize them to do their job and we learned how to work with the operator to optimize their human performance, developed injury prevention programs, developed uh mental uh, wellness programs, uh, take care of potential post-traumatic stress, post-traumatic issues, uh, sleep hygiene, huge. If you don't sleep, your body doesn't heal. So we started very simple and the impact we were able to have on not just this community, I think, and this is a collective, I'm just one very small pawn on this very big uh, team that we had uh, that was able to do this and, and put this together and I think execute something in which we were able to make a significant difference in their training, uh, their readiness, and their ability to perform. Do we have more work to do? Of course. However, 
that's something that's something we learned. We know we had to take care of, of the human performance. And me from the orthopedic and sports medicine and side was it was a great learning environment because I learned more from the physical therapists or mental health professionals, our internal medicine docs, people like Kirk Parsley and Jason Jagchu and Mark Rogo and uh, strength conditioning and I mean a whole slew of people it takes to take care of our military at the highest level was. Uh, something that I, I'm very proud to be involved with because we, we made, we've made a difference. 3,000 miles away from San Diego during your tenure at the Naval Medical Center, you witnessed the aftermath of September 11th and the Iraq War. Describe, if you can, Matt, the challenges and experiences you encountered while treating and caring for the injured servicemen and women returning home from these conflicts, what we've learned medically from the forever wars. I mean, there was one thing to sort of be sort of before 9-11 and then these 20 years after and everything that we've learned from Iraq and Afghanistan. Yeah, Josh, you know, this this is something that I know resonates with a lot of my partners, a lot of uh, residents we had in training. When I was in training, even as a resident, you know, this was actually starting and it quickly became staff. But our people that were in, in the trauma world and orthopedic trauma, general surgery trauma, we knew that we had to do better as a team. And so we had a great team that was very committed to taking care of the wounded warriors at the highest level. And what we learned there is we needed a better program. We needed a better system. We needed processes. We needed efficiencies. And we had to make sure that they were cared for as close as possible to where their family was so that they could recover and be mentally uh, sound so that they could rehabilitate and, and do a great job. And so the C5 program launched uh, military-wide, especially out of San Diego, Walter Reed, and San Antonio is the three major facilities. But I, I have to tell you, I mean, not just myself, but you know, certainly many others and my partners that, you know, do this day in, day out way more than I did and my hat's off to them. But, you know, we were, we were sitting around a conference room table all the time in Balboa, as we called it, named Medical Center San Diego. And I, we got war weary in a way. It was hard. It was hard to, um, you know, the you know the seeing the limbs that had been amputated, the new amputation we had to do, the limb reconstructions, the salvage, the burning flesh, the IED blast, and the stuff we would find in skin and buttocks, and these things that were put in these IEDs by. Uh, the enemy by the terrorists was, was was terrible. The stuff we would see in there, coat hangers bent up and shrapnel and glass and things. It was just, it was really devastating uh, injuries. But the, the coalition of the medical team to help our wounded warriors get back was was really amazing. I learned a lot. And, and my boss, Dana Covey, John Webster, Captain John Webster, Captain Dana Covey were always like, Preventure, I know you want to do this sports medicine, this and that. You're an orthopedic surgeon first. And you're going to care for these wounded warriors. And that was the mantra. You know, they didn't have to tell me. I mean, we're all over it. And, you know, we're going to take care of the mission, take care of what the government asks us to do. And, and we learned a lot. Let's pivot from the military medicine to the sports medicine through the unique character of Bill Belichick. You know, his his ties to the Navy are well chronicled. Coach was born in Annapolis. His dad, Steve, joined the Navy in the 40s, served in both the Euro Europe and the Pacific. In 1956, he joined Eddie Erdelatz's Navy football staff, where he'd spend the next 33 years until 1989 as, as an assistant coach and a scout. And when I was back at the yard, I walked by his headstone at Hospital Point. Were you aware of the connection that you had when you first got the opportunity with the Patriots? I, I did. And again, I, my hat's off to my dad, my family, everyone else, Josh, and that. Uh, so I got called by you know, the, the crafts to go interview for the head team physician job, uh, medical director for the Patriots. And uh, I knew Belichick had been at the Naval Academy. My dad had known Bill's cousin very well. They were classmates there. And my dad was actually played football and was coached by Steve, Bill's dad. So uh, it was great to connect my dad even with Bill after I yeah. got the job and everything. So, you know, a 45, supposed to be a 45 minute interview turned into about four hours of talking about exactly what we were talking about, you know, human, human performance, what we had done with, uh, the Navy special warfare, what we had done with the Marines, what we had done with everyone else to optimize human performance in the military. And I, I gotta tell you, Bill's a great guy. He's brilliant. He has a photographic memory. He's 
uh, super driven, super charged. I can tell you after one of the Super Bowls, he <laughs> he's like, all right, Matt, we, and we're literally at the party. He's like, all right, that was great. Great yeah. job. <laughs> da, 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 da. I need to meet with you on Sunday night. You know, I don't know what, 2 a.m. or something at the Super Bowl. <laughs> he's like, I need to meet with you on Tuesday so that we don't have the Jets, you know, bypassing what you call the, as he loved what I called it, the competitive medical advantage. And that's what we uh, tried to bring to the team. Were you surprised that of the six, seven open head coaching slots, coach didn't get one of those or didn't want one of those or they, the chemistry wouldn't be right the way it was with the craft? Yeah, I, I think that's I, I think that's potentially it. I, I, this is not the last we see of Bill Belichick, though. Much has been made of Tom Brady's fitness regimen and his work with Alex Guerrero. He wasn't that limber during his famous combine video. What was the secret to Tom's long-term success? He quit eating pizza and junk food. <laughs> and he had people like Alex who's uh, – Alex is amazing in, in many ways. And, you know, many pro athletes have gurus or helpers. And, you know, Alex is certainly one of those which Tom really took an affinity to, obviously. And, you know, we worked closely with Tom and Alex and our medical staff to optimize not just Tom but but everyone. And the – the concepts that Tommy has were as staying active and in the game. Guess what? It's the same things we were sort of doing with our Navy SEALs. Their their hips were tight. Their legs were tight. Their hamstrings were tight. They would get all these overuse injuries. Their uh, sleep cycles were off. Their adrenal axis was off. Tom was into all of that. Pliability, stretching, range of motion. And Alex was was a big part. So my hat's off to Tommy's... I, you know, whatever, whatever Tommy, Tommy's like reverse aging. It's unbelievable. And I, uh, he's great. And I, I love what, what he's doing. I love what he's doing for his body and keeping at the top of his game. He's a great leader. He's great inspiration. And for me, it was very special to have him around because he, he was just, he was just an amazing human and a big part of the success of that team because of what he did for preparation. And that was a big part of it, taking care of his body. When I was showing up here, Ryan walked me through the hallway and showed me the framed set of Julian Edelman's gloves. He spent 12 seasons with the team, didn't play in 2017 due to an ACL tear. How has treatment for that common injury changed over the years? And more broadly, given the type of player that number 11 was, how has the NFL and all sports in general evolved to manage con concussions better? Yeah, J JE eleven is a special player. I mean, that that guy is he's he's unbelievable. Um, love the guy. He's great leader, super driven. There's no harder worker, and you know his he just keeps taking a lick and keeps going. And he's just he, he's amazing. So I had kind of the same principles. And I you know I'm not sure what path he was on before I got there, but Tommy certainly <laughs> got with him and said, "Listen, you got to get your muscles, you got to get pliability, you got to get those hamstrings stretched. We don't want these overuse injuries." Now, being a, you know, a little bit shorter slot receiver, he's playing a tough position, and a position that can get injured quite a bit in the NFL, one we took care of quite a bit. Um, and it was a great pleasure to have the opportunity to take care of him and, you know, for his for his ACL or just any ACL in general, the technology has come so far since what we had 20 years ago. We're better at biologics. We're better at graft. We're better at uh, anatomically putting this back together of where your ligament used to be and how we – and all of that, guess what it adds up to? More efficiencies of rehabilitation, more predictable return to play, and getting your muscles back much better, Josh. So there's – there's a lot to be said about that guy's work ethic and, and who he is. And, you know, there was a special group around him, Gronk. And I mean, it, it's a very special group of, of players that, that Bill had assembled at that time. We had Gronk at the New York Stock Exchange last week for the IPO of Flutter, NYSC ticker, ticker symbol FLUT. It was great to see Gronk there. We also had Marshawn Lynch come through doing one of his In Your City Thursday night football packages and, and Marshawn was an incredible character but like bring us back to that 2014 Super Bowl you know they could have just handed the ball to Marshawn one yard over that goal line and instead they throw and Malcolm Butler does that interception you're on the sidelines in this team position what was that moment like for you 
Well, you know, being on the side of this team position is, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't play one snap or run one yard, but for me, it's kind of exhausting. <laughs> I know the medical team. I and saw some Jim of the Whale stress and, in your, in your, oh. in your visage when I looked at some of these <laughs> yeah, pictures totally. outside. Josh, it's, I mean, I, I'd, I'd be exhausted because it's, 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 it's stressful. You're, you're trying to take care of the team. You're getting them back. You're looking for injuries. You're trying to manage a lot of stuff and a lot of players and other things and external things. So it's, it's a lot being the, you know, head team physician. I didn't really realize it. And my hat's off to so many people that done a much better job than myself at it. But what I what I can tell you is that Super Bowl was really special. I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, yeah, great. We're gonna <laughs> well, we get the runner up ring. You know, that's okay. We did pretty well. And all of a sudden, you know, it picks it off. Now, what's interesting is <clears throat> Lombardi, Michael Lombardi, on the sideline, you know, near me, and you know, one of Belichick's helpers at the time. He's like. That's the exact play that they practiced, and I saw it. And we were there. We were at the practice facility at like Arizona State. We were at before, and we're at the practice facility. And it was one of the last two plays that they had practiced and run because of film, because of tape, because of preparation. It was that exact goal line play with Malcolm Butler picking it off. And I was like, I go back and I'm like, I remember that. <laughs> You're right. It's amazing. So practice and preparation, practice and preparation. That's. That was destined to happen, and the call was for a pass, and they were ready. The call was for a pass, and they were ready. Talking about being ready, I mean, you also worked with the NHL's Boston Bruins and MLB's Boston Red Sox as well. Saw that picture of number five, Dustin Pedroia, out in your hallway. Are there different methods of treatment or practices you need to follow when you're helping athletes at different sports? What's it like, for example, helping former Red Sox outfielder Mookie Betts or Bruins forward Brad Marchand recovery compared to Brady or Gronk? Yeah, I know, Josh, that's a really good question. It, it's it's sports-specific, but it's also, I think, even more important athlete-specific and wh- where they are uh, you know, in their game, where they are in their career, where they are in their contract season, if it's not, or where, where everything else. There, there's so many things that, that come into play in terms of how you go about managing athlete. I had several NFL players uh, here just this past week in, in Vail, and you know, a couple were like, you know, thinking about surgery, sort of on the edge, but they're in a contract year and we talked to their agent and we talked to <clears throat> their, there's an attorney and another agent who's an attorney and you know, they're, they're great. And, uh, and the agents are amazing. We work very closely with them, but that's, it, it's kind of a team decision to figure out what is best for the player. But each sport, each position of the sport has very unique requirements. We write about that. We research it. We publish it. We have different return to play guidelines for football versus hockey versus baseball versus skiing versus whatever there are there are many different requirements based on the unique aspects of your sport and that's i think another one of the very interesting advances in our field is how we're going about testing for that and using almost machine learning and uh again data and analytics to really inform to make informed decisions about return to play so matt since 2016 you've been practicing as a complex shoulder knee and sports surgeon here at the stedman clinic in colorado moving your focus from navy seals professional athletes although they're still coming through your door to now weekend warriors like me who use sport as a hobby instead of a profession how do you adjust and personalize the process for everyday individuals compared to whether you're working with a seal or a professional athlete in a contract year you know, my approach has always been about patient-centered care. And the patient could be an athlete, could be uh, chief of naval operations, could be brand new Marine just enlisting and leaving from Kansas to go to San Diego. For me, it's all about a patient-centered approach and having a discussion with the patient about options, outcomes, what we think, using the best data, using the best medical evidence, using <clears throat> collecting data with the imaging, their exam, their history, and, and really trying to take that personalized approach. It hasn't really been different for me from, from day one of medicine, and that's what we were was drilled into us at Dartmouth, is really making that patient-centered approach. And with that, I, it, it really helps because there's tough decisions. You know, you can live with this, or there's three different surgeries you can do, and here's this one, this one, this one. I'm going to leave you with what I think is a, is a good option for you, but these other two are very viable. That being said you're going to make this decision, not me. I'm going to give you the information and you're going to make it a best informed decision. And that's, that's how I like to practice. And that's how, why Vail is such a great fit, because that's what Stedman did to the Stedman clinic is really make it a patient centered about the patient. And that's 
that's what's really important. You mentioned Richard Stedman. He passed away about a year ago at the age of 85, a member of the U.S. National Ski Hall of Fame. He treated athletes like R- Ronaldo, Martina Navratilova, Montana, Bodie Miller. What has he meant to the practice of orthopedics? Yeah, he's amazing. We miss him dearly here. He he taught us all that, Josh, and reinforced those principles of just take great care of your patients. Listen to the patient. Take great care of your patients. Let them decide. We get tough cases here, and we like it, but we want to let the patient really weigh into their goals, their desires, and spend time with them. And that's what we—that's what we're about. And every time you, you know, get caught up and <laughs> every day and this and that, and you're running around, running around. You always have to take a deep breath and think about what Dick Stedman was about and what he taught us and what his principles were. And it's like any other mentor in any of our fields out there. Think about that. Great. When you're having a tough day, when you're having this, think about that great person. Take a deep breath, look at it from a 30,000 foot view and hit the reset button. And you know what? Everything's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. As we begin to wrap up, Matt, there's a story I read in the Summit Daily from 2009 before I came out here that Dr. Stedman got a call from the Vail Ski Patrol shortly after he took up practice. They reported they had a patient with a knee injury. It was a guy who'd been prone to falls and mishaps over his career. His name was Jerry Ford. President and Mrs. Ford were longtime beloved fixtures in Vail. What do they mean to this place, and how have you seen it change over the years since they were skiing down the slopes? Yeah, I, I wish I had the opportunity to hang out and just have dinner with them. You know, one of those one of those icons in in our government and our world as a leader. They've been incredible uh, people to have here in Vail. Uh, incredible philanthropists. In, incredible for the community uh, because of who they who they are and, and who they were. And and I can see why Stedman got along so well with them because they're they're very similar mindset. Great leaders. Uh, calm, calm in a storm, always doing the best they can, always putting their best foot forward all the time for their job and for their people. Lastly, just want to get from you your philosophy around your website, The Predictors, which analyzes injuries to the top NFL players. The site also features the Health Matters podcast where you and your colleagues give further insights. I see all your rig here. You are ready to go, sir. Uh, How do you believe these platforms contribute to enhancing public understanding and awareness of injuries in pro sports, especially at a time when sports gambling is so prevalent? The need for injury information is at an all-time high. Yeah, you know, Josh, I have to credit, uh, you know, people like Jonathan Kraft and others and, you know, people that are very into the data analytics of, of what we do and, and who we are. And, you know, I, I started my journey with this, you know, again, way back in uh, with the Navy SEALs, with the military of optimizing performance and preventing injury. If you had injury to try to optimize their return and, and using that data to get them back and stay healthy and creating a safer environment as best you can in the military, creating a safer environment as best you can in the NFL, NBA, NHL. And that's really the goal is, is using data analytics to help the NFL Players Association, to help the players, to help understand the true differences between grass and artificial and hybrid now we're talking about, to understand why World Cup uses it in soccer, but uh, you know we don't always use it in NFL. And there's you know there's logistical challenges there at stadiums and things like that. But the the, the data and the analytics tell a great story in terms of how we can make a better game, how we can make it safer, how we can prolong the longevity of the three point six, three point eight years average longevity of an NFL player. Which what's your perfect? Service? I want to. I want to. I want to do it. Well. It's hard to argue with grass. You know, maybe it's hybrid, but grass again in our data, the predictors shows that grass for all injuries and all comers is safer. Now it's getting better. The game's getting safer. It's getting better, but injuries are part of every sport we play. It's a part of your skiing today potential. It's part of NHL. It's part of baseball. It's part of high school sports. Our goal is to try to minimize it as best we can, and we use data and the analytics. And so at the predictors, that's the journey we've been on is helping to try to optimize player health, player safety, and then understand uh, what what an injury means to a team, to a game, and giving 
information to the public through uh, Fox Sports, which I've worked with extensively on what that injury means and, and really just informing the public about what's a calf strain, what's a hammy, what's an ACL, what's a shoulder dislocation versus a separation, what's a neck strain, what's a stinger, what's, and, and really informing the public about things we take care of all the time. And so I got a great team with 100 years of NFL sideline experience among everything else that puts this all together and uh, try to help uh, understand the game and health better. Where do our listeners go to find the site and uh, the podcast and follow more about you and your work? Yeah, Justin, check out the thepredictors.com. I also have some information at, at the Stebbin Clinic and uh, Preventure MD as well. As you consider the advancements in technology that we've been talking about today that are expediting the re- recovery process, here we are in 2024, Matt. Where are we in 2028, 2034 in terms of the practice of orthopedics and, and advancing in this technology and focus? Josh, what we're seeing is more minimally invasive techniques, more minimally invasive approaches, more use of your own biologics, taking advantage of your own genetics, your own DNA, type matching, everything to help us heal injuries better and getting you back more efficiently, more predictably, and stronger than you were. That's where we're going. It's super exciting time to be involved in orthopedics, orthopedic sports medicine, or just medicine in general. The Data and analytics are going to help us a ton on that, and the ability to three-dimensionally understand our world. You know, Keep in mind, we started with x-rays. It's two-dimensional. Then we got MRI, still two-dimensional. Then we got 3D CT. Then we're working on 3D imaging and other 3D MRIs, and we're, we're going to be able to really understand in an augmented reality environment how to treat you better. Steady Stedman loved skiing. He loved sports. He loved calamari. According to my research. (laughs) Every every time we went out to dinner with him, it was great. George Gillette, in one of his eulogies, said, we all discovered that this was a very fully rounded man. So beyond the military, medicine, and sports, what are the things that make Matt Preventure here in Vail a fully rounded man, the kind of things that just turn you on? Well, you know, many, many thanks out to, you know, my wife and my family and my parents and and brother and everyone else around me to... You need a great support group, and so I definitely want to thank all of them. And it's great watching my kids grow up, and you know, be a part of so many different fun activities, and, and just growing up into you know young adults at this point. It's it's really truly amazing. I uh, I try to take time for myself. I you know, and it's hard at, at times, but I really try to get up in the morning. I try to have time for myself in the in the gym, or get up for an early Nordic session, or an early skin up the mountain. Uh, in the winter, in the summer, it's biking, it's mountain biking, it's road biking. We have between my wife and I, I think we have like seven or eight bikes now. I don't know why it's just kind of acquired them and gravel and road and mountain and all hybrid and whatever. But that's great. And we also we spent a lot of time in San Diego and Coronado, and we were very blessed that the Navy kept us there almost about 17, 18 years. I was deployed a bunch, but you know, which is also stationed in Japan and Africa and many other places. But we. Uh, we, we love San Diego and, and love getting back there as well. And, and that's a very special place for us where you know, our, our kids were raised on early. So we, we're, we're very blessed, very honored to be where, where we are in life. Well, I'm blessed and honored to be able to walk into the Stedman Clinic today to look at the annals of all your patients and what you've done for them and then to be able to sit down with you for this hour. Thanks so much for joining us inside the Ice House. Josh, an absolute pleasure, and you know, congratulations on your incredible story. It's it's a great honor to be here with you today at my desk in Vail, watching the mountain and seeing your your sun tanned uh, sun tanned uh, cheeks there and uh, goggle tan. I love it after a great legendary thirty two thousand. Thanks, day. buddy. It's awesome. Great day. Thanks very much yes, for joining. Appreciate us. it. And that's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Dr. Matt Preventure one of the nation's leading orthopedic surgeons, naval doctor, and former team physician for the New England Patriots. If you like what you heard, please rate us on Apple Podcasts so other folks know where to find us. And if you've got a comment or question you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show or to hear a guest like Matt Preventure, make sure to leave a review. Email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Lance Glynn with production assistance, editing, and engineering from Ken Abel. Pete Ash is the Director of Programming and Production at ICE, and I'm Josh King, your host, signing off. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. 
Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 